I'm always amazed every single Sunday how faithful God is to us to show up when we offer our praise and our worship to him. Amen. It's just amazing that, you know, we can come into the presence of God. It's not some small thing. This is the God, the creator of the universe, the creator of the universe. Here he is. And we get to worship and praise him and he shows up and he's faithful. He loves us and uh, knows right where to touch our hearts. Amen. How many people were touched by God in the presence of God? This afternoon, amen, amen. Just take that with you. You don't, you don't let that go. You know, guard that every single, every single time that, that happens. Just don't just take it for granted. Oh yeah, I'll come back again on Sunday. No, guard it throughout the week and just say, okay, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna live out of this. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let this be kind of a, an occasion or just a, 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 a stop during my week. But live from that. Live from that presence of God. Let that be your source of life and strength all throughout the week. Get filled up again next Sunday and, you know, continue in the presence of God. Guard that. Because the world wants to suck that out of you. The world is not based on God's principles. And the things in this world, they, it wants to suck the presence of God out of, you, out of us. But we need to guard and protect it. Say, no, God, this is what you said. This is your word to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steward that well and, uh, and come back next Sunday, you know, ready for more, ready for uh, another touch from God and use what God gives you all throughout that week to be a blessing to other people. Amen. Amen. That was not a part of my message at all, <clears throat> but it's good, uh, good exhortation. Um, I want to introduce a couple people. We have uh, a team from Hamilton. I grew up in Canada, and uh, we have part of the team here. Can you guys all stand up? John and Heather and Renee. And there's a bunch more. Yeah, put your hands together. And uh, Heather and Renee, stand up again. Okay. This is my sister here, and this is my niece. Yeah, they've come all the way from Canada, and uh, uh, it's a real honor and a privilege. You guys can sit down now. I'm embarrassed you enough. It's a real honor and a privilege, you know, to have people that you know, that have known you for a long, long time, and uh, uh, love you, and they sacrifice and come all the way over here for, uh, to spend time here. I know not just with me, but, um, no, it's, I'd like to think it's just for me, but it's not really. <clears throat> but it is a blessing, and, uh, and so any time that, you know, you can, spend with family, you know, spend it with them, because... Uh, you know, family knows you better than, be, be nice to your family, because family knows you better than anybody else, and if you're not nice to them, they have stories that they might uh, share with other people. So you got to be nice to them, honor them, give them all the respect, because you want them to be nice to you too, right? So, uh, yeah, so please be nice to me when you're talking to people. All right, we're, uh, we finished, earlier this month, we finished uh, a, a series on growth. How many people were here and enjoyed the series that we did on growth at the beginning of 2020? Maybe you've heard a couple of those messages. Maybe you haven't. Uh, so for the first part of January, we did a series on growth. And uh, last week, we did our Vision Sunday uh, for all that God has done and all that God is going to do in the future, what we're preparing for, what we're looking forward to as a church. Today, we begin a new series on the Ten Commandments. And uh, it's not what you think it is. Uh, we'll get into it in just a minute. But before we do, sometimes we think about the law as something uh, strict and judgmental. But I want to tell you some of the crazy laws that are in the United States. Still some crazy laws that are still on the record here in the United States. In Alabama, it's illegal to drive blindfolded. Did you know that? It's illegal to drive blindfolded. However, I don't know how long you're going to be able to drive down the road blindfolded, but if the, uh, yeah, it's still on record as a law that's still on record in Alabama. So I don't know how you're going to tell if the police are behind you if you're blindfolded and you've got to pull over, but that's one of the rules. Um, in Arizona, it's illegal for a donkey to sleep in a bathtub. It's, a, it's illegal for a donkey to sleep in a bathtub. He can sleep in the sink or on the front porch or something, but not in the bathtub, okay? All right? 
in Arkansas, you can't honk your horn near a sandwich shop after 9 p.m. I know, it's so specific, right? After 9 p.m., in front of a sandwich shop, no honking your horns. That's illegal. Isn't that weird? I don't know how they get some of these laws. It's probably like one person's experience. He did this thing one time. They're like, no, 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 you can't do that. So we'll make a law just for this one guy. In, in Colorado, it's illegal to keep a couch on your porch. No, we're, you're not allowed to keep a couch. A, a rocking chair, okay, maybe a swing or whatever, but not a couch. In Connecticut, a pickle must be able to bounce. You have to have... Okay, so I'll read the description for this one. It says, According to our friends at Country Living, in the 1800s, a group of men wrongfully sold cucumbers marked as pickles. To right this wrong, officials declared that a pickle is legitimate only if it bounces. <laughs> Can you believe that? It has to be able to bounce. So before you eat your pickles... On a Sunday afternoon lunch, see if it bounces or not. Uh, in Delaware, you can't sell dog hair. All right. And in Georgia, it's illegal to live on a boat for more than 30 days. All right, so there's some of the funny laws that are around the United States, and there's tons more. Uh, I'm sure you can find your own on the Internet. But that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the Ten Commandments. We're going to talk about the law. And... What we're going to do in this series is we're going to look at the law from a different perspective. I think as Christians, sometimes we think, we might think, you know, the law, oh, that's judgment, that's uh, pain, that's do this, don't do that, make sure you live this way, make sure you, love, you do this, do this, don't do that. And, and that's kind of how we think about the law. But what we want to do in this series, we want to show you what the purpose of God's law is and how to look at the law through the lens of relationship. Because that's the reason that God gave us the law, is for relationship. Now, what I want to do is I want to look at the Ten Commandments. We're going to, you know, when we talk about the law, we're going to summarize it in the Ten Commandments. In the Old Testament, you know, we have the Torah, or the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Most of the uh, Ten Commandments starts in uh, Exodus chapter 20. And then there's several laws, uh, ceremonial laws, priestly laws, all through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and it's recapped all in Deuteronomy. But we're going to focus on the Ten Commandments for this series. And today we're going to do an introduction, and then each week we're going to take one of the commands and look at the principles behind the command. Not just the words itself, but the principles and what God meant for us for godly living through the principles in that specific law. But today we're just going to kind of look at it broadly, and we're going to see what God has for us through the Ten Commandments. So what we're going to do is we're going to put the first four up there. If you want to write in your notes, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. That's where the Ten Commandments are listed. So the first four commands, okay? Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number four, remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Number five, honor your father and mother. Number six, you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number ten, you shall not covet. So th those are the Ten Commandments that we see in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. And those are referred to as the Ten Commandments. They would be the, the laws of Moses or the, 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 the foundation of the law for the Israelites. And it's something that we, as kids, you know, if you're growing up in a Christian home, you memorize the Ten Commandments because your mom and dad want you to be good. And so you got to, you know, especially number five there, honor your father and mother, that's a big one. Uh, don't steal from your brother and sister, you know, all that sort of stuff. So it's always good 
this is what we memorize as the law. But there's so much more to it than performance. There's so much more to it than just actions and, and the right way to living. And I think if we look at it just in terms of performance, we're only kind of scratching the surface, and it's not giving us a real clear uh, picture of what God really wanted for us when he gave us the Ten Commandments. Why did God give us the Ten Commandments? I say that God gave us the Ten Commandments for relationship. For relationship. God gave us the Ten Commandments for living a life in unity and in good relationship with him and with other people around us. Okay? God wants us to live in a community with good relationships. Okay? For those of you who are parents or kids, once you have one kid, okay, there are some rules that you have for the other kids, you, they, they have for the kids, but then once you have more kids, you got to make more rules because there's problems in the relationship, right? Okay, so, you know, don't, you know, take your Cheerios from the other kids or don't, you know, steal this or don't do that from the other kids. Make sure you knock on the door before you go bursting into your brother's room or all that sort of stuff. You have to make more and more rules. But the reason is, is not because you're trying to control them, but because you love this kid, but you also love this kid too. You love all of your kids the same, and you want them to have good, what? Relationship together. You want to have good relationship between the parents and the, and the, and the children, but you also want the children to have good relationship with each other as well. So that's why we make house rules. Do this. Respect each other. Respect other people's privacy. You know, don't play your music too loud or don't do this or don't do that. Why? So that we can continue to have good relationship together. Now, I want to show you this in a few different ways. Where, how we see God's desire for relationship through the Ten Commandments. So let's go to uh, the slide that has the first four commands on it again. Okay? So, number one, you shall have no other gods before me. This is the word of God to the Israelites through Moses. So this is God's words. You shall not have any other gods before me. This is God talking to the Israelites. Don't have any other gods. What relationship does this have to do with? The Israelites' relationship with God. Okay, this first command has to do with this, this vertical relationship between us and God. Don't have any other gods before me. Because God wants priority in our lives. He wants to be number one. He wants to be the center of everything that we do and say. Number two, same thing. Relationship is vertical. You shall not make yourself a carved image or any likeness. Okay? So once again, God doesn't want us bowing down to idols or doing this or doing that. Be why? Because he cares about this relationship between us and him. Number three is also, shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That's caring and respecting the Lord and our relationship of love with him. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is, this is part of our um, relationship with God because it says this, it's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Rest on the seventh day. It's a Sabbath to the Lord your God. It's that vertical relationship. So the first four commands are all about our relationship with God. You see that? Everybody see that? Now let's go to the, the last six. Now, now we start to look at our horizontal relationship with other people. Okay? Honor your father and mother, okay? Don't murder. Okay? If you, if you murder people, you're going to have a hard time having a good relationship with them, right? Okay? If you, same thing, you know, don't commit adultery, don't steal. This is all about our horizontal relationship with other people. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet. So the first four 
are this vertical relationship that we have with God. The last six are this horizontal relationship that we have with other people. So we see that in the Ten Commands. Now, what did Jesus say is the law of love? You shall what? Love who? The Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. So once again, in God's, you know, Jesus is basically just summarizing everything, but he's using the words of relationship. Love God, that's this vertical relationship. And love others as you love yourself. That's the horizontal part. And he even went on to say, Jesus even went on to say, if you do this, you're going to fulfill all the law and all the prophets. So take care of this relationship and this relationship, the horizontal or the vertical and the horizontal. So Jesus or God gave this law so that we would have good relationships. Now, I want you to know that God did not give us this law as a way of achieving salvation. Okay? Sometimes we, we, we think that way. Sometimes people think that way or they see Christians and they think, okay, they have to do this, 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 and this, and this in order to be accepted and loved by God. That is not true. That is not the reason why God gave the Ten Commandments. Okay? And it's not the way that we continue in our relationship with God either. It's, it, it's not the way of salvation. Okay? So these commands are not the way of salvation. But why were they given? The way the, in order to understand why they were given, it's important to look at a little bit of the history of when the, the Ten Commands and the Law of God was given to the Israelites. Okay? So we're going to go back and look at just kind of a brief history of from Abraham all the way through till Moses gave the, uh, received the Ten Commandments from God. In Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis uh, chapter 15, God appeared to Abraham. Okay, Abraham is known as the father of faith, the father of the Israelite um, community, the father of the country of Israel. But he, God came to Abraham and met with Abraham, and God said, you're going to be blessed. You're going to, you know, he took him outside, saw all the stars in the sky, and said, as many stars as you can see, that's how many uh, uh, descendants you're going to have. And what does it say about Abraham? It says that he believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Okay? He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham is the father of faith, and it was through that faith and through that belief that he was made righteous. Okay? So here we have, even, even before the law, okay, this was hundreds and hundreds of years before Moses even received the law from God. We see that Abraham, Abraham believed, and it was credited to God as righteousness. Okay, we see that in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15. We also see God uh, appearing and showing himself to Isaac and meeting up with Isaac. And God was renewing this covenant of faith with Abraham's family. So that Isaac and Jacob. And then Jacob had 12, 12 boys and, and Joseph was one of those 12. Joseph was led as a slave into Egypt. Okay, And in Egypt, he suffered, but then God raised him up, and he basically became the prime minister of all of Egypt. He had, he had influence, he had wealth, he had wisdom from the Lord. He was interpreting dreams, and he gained a lot of influence in Egypt. As a result, God brought Jacob and all of the brothers, and they began to live in Egypt. So now Abraham's family... The beginnings of Israel, the, the beginnings of the community of Israel, the beginnings of the country of Israel are now living in Egypt. And they were there for 440 years. After Joseph died, the Bible says that they forgot 
the leaders of Egypt forgot about Joseph and all of the things that, they, that he had done to save them from the famine. And so they forgot about Joseph, and eventually, over those 400 years, the Israelites became the slaves of Egypt. They became the slaves of Egypt. And so they were living as slaves in a foreign country when God's promise to them was that they were going to be their own nation. Okay? They're going to be their own nation. And the story goes is that Moses was raised up. This was 440 years after, after they all went to Egypt. 440 years later, God raises up Moses, does miraculous signs, and we see the ten plagues where God spoke his judgment on Egypt and on the gods of Egypt. The god of the river, the god of the frogs, the god of the sun, the god of all of the different gods of Egypt were, were, were struck down by the plagues that God brought on the Egyptians. So God was doing miracles for the Israelites to bring them out of slavery. That was God's work in that time. That was God's miracles in that time. And so eventually Pharaoh said, all right, I've had enough. You guys can go. God did miracles, and then the, the Israelites were allowed to leave. God redeemed Israel from slavery. Okay, it's important that we see that. God redeemed. God brought them out from slavery. Okay, so God redeemed them. We also see the very last plague was the plague of when all of the firstborn sons of the Egyptians died. This was a very important piece because in Exodus chapter 12, we see what God told the Israelites to do in order to receive salvation from death. Take a lamb, take its blood, Put the blood on the, on the door frame and the doorposts of the house. Okay? Stay inside. Eat the flesh of the lamb. Stay there through the night. The, the, the destroyer will come. And once the destroyer sees the blood, the destroyer cannot enter. This is a, so symbolic. This was the very, very first Passover. And year after year after year after year, the Israelites celebrated the Passover by taking a lamb, taking the blood, putting it on the doorpost, staying inside to remember the redemption of God from the, from the Egyptians. That's what God did. And it's something that they did and something that they remembered. And it's very significant because that day was, it says, on the first day, this is going to be a new year for you. This is the very, very first year. This is going to be the very, very first day of the first month, of the first year of the, of, basically of all time for the country of Israel. And so, this was the beginning of the country of Israel. They left on that day, on that Passover day. And so God redeemed them through the blood. God, through the lamb that was sacrificed for their lives. And because of that, then they had freedom. After that, God leads them by the cloud by day and the fire by night. They end up at the Red Sea. All of the Israelites end up at the Red Sea. There was probably, they said there were 600,000 men. So if each man had a wife, Maybe two kids. It's probably about two and a half million at the, at the, the very least. Two and a half million people that God and Moses were leading out of Egypt. They end up at the Red Sea. They're stuck there because there's the Red Sea, the mountains. Then Pharaoh decides, all right, they took everything. Let's go after them and slaughter them all in the wilderness. But God, God saved them. They were fretting. They didn't know what to do. But God spoke to Moses, stretch out your staff over the Red Sea. Another miracle. God opens up the Red Sea. The word of God was the, be still and know that I'm, the, the enemies that you see today, you're never going to see them again. They went through the Red Sea, which if you look in the New Testament and the writings of Paul, symbolic of baptism. 
They passed through the waters. God brought them into the waters and out of the waters. And then uh, Pharaoh and all his uh, uh, guys on his chariots are riding in, and they're following them. And what happens? The sea closes. <laughs> Destroys all of the armies of Egypt. They never had a problem with the Egyptians again after that. They were destroyed. Their enemies were destroyed. Then God leads them into the wilderness. So we see the redemption. We see the deliverance. And it wasn't until they were in the wilderness that then they received the commands. So the same is true in our Christian life as well. God did not give us commands in order to do this and this and this and this for salvation. God brings us into a relationship through his love. We can't earn salvation. Put that out of your mind right now. You cannot earn salvation. No chance. You can't do enough. You can't do enough to earn your salvation. You can't take away your sins. Only Jesus who died on the cross with the blood on the doorway in the shape of a cross is our hope for salvation. He is our only hope. It's not the law, but the provision and the blessings of God bring us into a relationship, bring us into a relationship with him. You know, we know the story of what happened in, 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 in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had relationship with God. They communed with God in the Garden. They were there with Him. And once they sinned, boom, that relationship was broken. But God wasn't satisfied with a broken relationship. He says, I want them to have relationship with me again. So right from the very beginning, he said, he promised in his, even in the, the, the curses that God was speaking to Adam and to Eve and to, to the serpent, God said, but there will be a seed that comes from the man and the woman who will crush the head of the serpent. That promised seed is Jesus, victorious one, the Messiah, the one who died, not just died, but rose again. All of the symbolism of the Passover points to Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? He is our hope. He is our hope. So God brings us into this relationship. Not through obeying the law, but through faith. And now we are welcomed as sons and daughters into this relationship. But as sons and daughters, God also wants us to continue in relationship with him. He doesn't want us just to be sons and daughters who sit on the couch all the time and just kind of, oh, yeah, whatever, God, yeah, oh, whatever. No, he wants us to live the abundant life that he has. In John 10.10, 10, it says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. But we have to walk in that relationship. So, the law was not given as a means of salvation. But it was given after redemption, after deliverance, for our benefit, for the benefit of this community because now we have two and a half million people living out in the wilderness they need some laws in order to live in good relationship with God and in good relationship with others so it's the same that's true for our life as well I want to read a couple of verses that show this again in Exodus chapter 20 li listen to this language of God then God spoke all these words. Listen to what this is. He says, I am the Lord your God. That's the language of relationship. I am your God. I am your God. That's relationship. That's, I brought you out from Egypt. I brought you out from slavery. I am your God. He's not saying, 
yeah, I'm God. You know, I, you got to obey me, bow down. No, he's like, I want relationship with you. I am your God. I am your God. And it continues. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Never, ever forget. Before you read the laws, remember the God who gives the laws. I am the Lord your God. And remember where you were brought out of. You were brought out of a place of slavery. You were brought out of Egypt. This is our God. God wants relationship with us. I want to give you another example of relationship as well. In the garden... Okay, this is one of my favorite, verse, or my favorite uh, stories in the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve. I think every message that I uh, preach ends up back in the garden. <laughs> God gave Adam and, all, Adam and Eve one law, and we all know what that is. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Unfortunately, they weren't very good at obeying just the one law. So they uh, did what they weren't supposed to do, and they, obey, they ate from the tree of knowledge and good and, of good and evil. But once again, think about this. The question is, I mean, it's kind of a crazy, crazy question. Or you you kind of got to dig into the God's mind to figure out, okay, well then why did God give this tree in the first place? You know, God said everything's good, but then he put this, gar he put this tree in the middle of the garden, why did he put that there in the first place? And I think the answer to that is in what God wanted from Adam and Eve and the reason why God created Adam and Eve. God created Adam and Eve for four reasons. Okay, let's look in uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. I think we got it up on the screen. Okay, then God said, let us make man in our image. So there's the first one, to, after our likeness. So it's to be, to live in the image of God. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every, okay, listen to this, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So first one is to have the character of God, to be in the image of God. Number two, to have dominion, Okay. Think about this. I'm going to bring this, this point of dominion up in just a minute. But dominion over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Okay, let's continue 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Look at the, ver the first words of verse 28. And God blessed them. God blessed them. God didn't demand anything from them. God blessed them. God is a God of blessing. Just like in redemption, deliverance, salvation, that's the blessing of God on our lives. God always comes with a blessing first. God blessed them. Then he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we see three things. We see character, rulership, and um, what's the third one? Reproduction. But then also there's relationship that's mixed in there too. We see that God came into the garden, communing with God, the love relationship that's all there. So the four things: character, dominion, relationship, and reproduction. Okay, so those are the four purposes of God, or sorry, for the four purposes that God has for man. And it's, honestly, it's the four purposes for all of us. We don't have time to look into it all, but those are the four purposes that God has for our individual lives as well. So then we go back to that tree. That tree that's in the middle of the garden that God created and God said was good. Everything was good. So if this tree of knowledge of good and evil is good, why did God say don't eat from it? This is what I would propose to you guys. God created that tree as a place to fulfill God's four purposes. 
That's the place where God said to Adam and Eve, you can't have this. You can have all the other stuff. There's no problem there. You can eat the apples, oranges, all that stuff. But don't eat that tree. In obedience, if they were to say, okay, I'm not going to eat that, they're showing character. They're showing self-control. They're showing love for God in relationship. I want that, but I'm going to say no because my relationship with God is more important than that, and my God told me not to, so I'm not going to. So they were to fulfill character and relationship right at that tree. They were to fulfill dominion because God gave them rulership over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creeping thing that creeped on the earth. The creeping thing that was creeping in that tree was a serpent that had legs at the time. And so it was creeping through the trees. The that tree was the place for them to have rulership. And also, that was the place where they were to teach the generations after them about the ways of God and to reproduce their love for God, their relationship with God at that tree. They were supposed to look at that tree and say, nope, this is where we show love to God by obeying Him. Maybe we don't understand it, but we show love to God here. This is where we have dominion over that serpent. He's tempting us. We're going to say no to him. We're going to say yes to our God. This is where they were to have character. And God was going to build their character more and more and more. And like we said, it's also the place to reproduce as well. So that tree was the place of temptation, yes, but it was also meant to be the place of their victory. And the same is true with these commands that God gives us as well. God wants us to live in relationship with Him and in relationship with others. God wants us. God gave us the commands for us to live. To live a godly life. To live after His ways. You know, God makes us his children, his sons and daughters. But he also wants us to grow up as well. God loves us the way he is, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. He wants us to change and to grow and to be more like him. And so the commands are kind of God's blueprint for how to live a godly life, but it's also kind of like the kind of like the manual you get when you buy a new car or buy a new moto or something. It comes with a book. If you want this motorcycle to last a long time, make sure you do this. Make sure you do that. Don't put gasoline in where the, the, the uh, oil is supposed to go. Or, you know, make sure you do everything just right. God created us, and he knows what's good for us and what's not good for us. This life that we live was meant to be lived a certain way. And so the, the laws don't save us. The laws don't redeem us. Only Jesus can do that. But God wants us to live in his ways. Let's look at a few more verses. We read, uh, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll read that one in just a minute. First John. John was, is interesting, if you read the book of John, John calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. I always found that kind of funny. Every, every you know, time he's referring to himself in the book of John, yep, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. Ah, I'm G the disciple, that's me. I'm, I'm the disciple that Jesus loved. Sounds kind of like he was bragging, right? I mean, who would even write that in there? The disciple that Jesus loved. You mean he didn't love any of the other guys? I don't know. But I don't think it was bragging by any means. I think he had a true revelation of God's love. And he just said, wow, Jesus loves me so much. Jesus loves me so much. And it said that John 
was a disciple that was closer to Jesus' heart than any of the other ones. You know, there was the 12, then there was the three, Peter, James, and John. But then John was the one that was so close to Jesus. And Jesus, even when Jesus was on the cross, John was the one that Jesus asked to take care of his mom. But John had a special revelation of Jesus' love for him. And we see that every time you read, you know, the book of John, you see those intimate times. You know, John has more words of Jesus in the last night of, before Jesus went to the cross than any other of the other Gospels. There's so much more. The prayers of Jesus, the prayers for the disciples, the words of Jesus on that last night. Je John was just trying to remember it all and just wrote it all down. <clears throat> but there's, there's a common theme of love in the book of John. And we, you see in John and then 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John as well. And I just want to read a few of these. And look at the relationship between the com commands and the love of God. First one is 1 John 3, verse 24. Whoever keep his keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. You want to abide in God, keep his commands. You want to abide in God, keep his commands. Worship the Lord your God. Don't do anything to offend God. Don't do anything to speak against God. Live in good relationships with other people. And you will live in the peace and the joy and the abundance that God provides. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God. Let's go to the next verse. Let's go to the next slide, please. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. This is how we can show our love to God. Just like Adam and Eve were supposed to show their love to God at that tree of knowledge of good and evil, we can show our love to God by obeying his commandments. It's not meant to be burdensome. It's not meant to be, oh, this weight of the commands of God. No, we live in not just the Ten Commandments, but we live in the law of love. We live in the law of the Spirit. And these are the things that God encourages us and helps us and, and gives us the strength to do at all times. Let's go to the next verse. This one's in John chapter 15. This is the, the famous passage. I am the vine, you are the branches. Fruitfulness, abiding in love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Keeping the commandments. It's not just, oh yeah, we're, we just have the love of God, la-di-da. No, we keep his commands. We're living in his love. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So even Jesus, even Jesus was keeping his commands and abiding in his father's love. These things I have spoken to you. Why? That my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So it's not just about being in God and abiding with Him and being in His love, but it, these things bring joy and fullness of joy as well. God wants you to have a blessed life. We don't earn our salvation, our deliverance, our redemption by keeping the laws. God, Jesus did that on the cross. Jesus bled. The destroyer passed over us. We were not destroyed, but we were brought into salvation. But as we continue to live, God has a way of living for us. A way of life, abundant life for us. And that's the commands that he gives. So to summarize everything, why did God give the law? The Ten Commandments, the law, were not given as a way of salvation. But they were given in order for us to have good relationship with Him, which was the first four commands. 
and in order for us to live in good relationship with others around us as well. That's commands 5 through 10. It's a way for redeemed people to live the abundant life. The abundant life doesn't start when we die and go to heaven. You know, I used to think as a kid, you know, you memorize John 3, 16, God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I always used to think, yeah, I'm going to pray the sinner's prayer. That way when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. And then I'll live the abundant life. Or, you know, that's kind of how we think. But that was, that's not what that verse meant. It means believe and you begin the abundant life. You begin living in the abundant life. You, li you begin living in the Father's house with the provision and all of the blessings of the Father. And from now on, all the way to when we die and through death into eternity, we can live that abundant life. And the commands, the way that God gave for us is part of that. God meant for us to live an abundant life. So the next number of weeks, we're going to take one command, not as a do this, don't do that sort of thing. We're going to look at each command as a principle, as a principle for living that can help to shape who we are as Christians, as people who follow God and who want to live in love with our Heavenly Father. If you have... If you, love, if, you love the God, if you love God, keep his commands, just like these verses say. So as a community, that's what we want to do. We want to show our love to our Heavenly Father. We want to live in that abundant life. We want to show love to each other as well and live in good relationship with him. So that's what we're going to be, going to be doing. We're going to take one for each week. And so we'd encourage you guys to keep coming back. If you have to miss it, we're, we'll have them on Facebook and Facebook Live, and we also put these up on YouTube as well. And uh, we're going to be doing it in English. We're going to be doing it in Khmer. Uh, so that's the series that we're going to be going through. But this is the foundation of it. Not as a rule that oh, I have to do this in order to, for God to be happy. No, God's a happy God already. You don't have to do that. There's nothing that you can do you know, to make him more happier. Okay? He's not going to get all mad and have a bad day because you broke one of his laws. He's happy already. But for us <laughs> to, to live in that blessing, that closeness, that intimacy with him, because that's what we all want. We want to live with God. Amen? Can you guys all stand up? We're going to stand up and we're going to pray. But I realize that there may be people here this afternoon where you haven't experienced that redemption. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do. No keeping of the law will give you eternal life. No keeping of the law will usher you into the gates of heaven. But believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, confessing our sins, believing in, in our hearts, that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life is the way into relationship with him. If you have never, ever prayed to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life, to forgive your sins, we'd love to encourage you and help you with that this afternoon. It's the opportunity of a lifetime. It's the opportunity of a new lifetime. It just says people who have faith will be born again. Or maybe you feel like you're living far away from God. God, I haven't been so faithful to you. I want to make a renewed commitment. I want to repent. I want to confess. We'd love to talk with you, to pray with you, to believe God, to lead you in that way to begin that new relationship with God again. And so if that's you, we're going to have our leaders up at the front here at the end of the service. Yeah, guys, come on up. 
If you guys want to pray with one of us, we'd love to meet you. We're not going to do anything embarrassing, but just know that we, all of us, we've done this before. We've said, yeah, I need, I need prayer. I need salvation. I need redemption. I need to be saved. Please help me. We all need each other. We've all done this before. So if, if it's you, please don't be embarrassed. We don't mean to embarrass you. We want to join together with you in praying. But we'd encourage you, when we, after we pray, come on up and meet with some of us. Let's pray here. Let's close our eyes, bow our heads. Jesus, you are so wonderful. Your goodness to us, we can't fathom. We can't think about it. Your ways are too high. Your love is so great. And even in our failures, you say, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I don't forget about you. I don't push you aside. I don't reject you. But I love you. These are your words to us, Jesus. And you say, come. Come. Your invitation, your love, your invitation is here for us. Not just for one day, but it's for every day. And Jesus, in our hearts today, we respond to you. And we say thank you. Thank you for the love that we cannot fathom. Thank you for the love and the grace that we can't explain. Thank you for the love that goes beyond understanding. The only thing we can do is to open up our arms and receive. Lord, I pray that this afternoon you would shower your love upon each one. Oh God, baptize us in your love. Fill us to overflowing with your love so that it just pours out from us and makes us new and refreshed and clean and hopeful and, and longing for the future because of your goodness to us, God. Lord, I pray for if there's anybody here tonight, today that if they have not had this encounter with you or they need to have this encounter with you again, speak to them right now. Speak to them. Say, son, daughter, I love you. Come, come and receive. Come and receive all that I have for you, all of the joy, all of the goodness, all of the peace, because it's here for you and it's available. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your encouragement for us. I thank you for your law that shows us the way to live. And Lord, in the weeks to come, help us to grow closer to you through the principles of your word. Help us to change to be more like you. Show us the areas in our hearts where we need to grow more. God, in your faithfulness and in your gentleness, we ask you to do these things and we give our lives to you all that we have, we give it to you because you are good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.